Excellent. So um, I'm just kind of ad-libbing here. If you've joined one of my webinars before, you'll realize that I just talked for an hour. Uh, I don't like these things to be too stuffy and too professional. I'm going to be my authentic self. Um, and so hopefully that makes it a little bit more easy to follow. I make it two minutes past. I think it's just before on the official clock. So let's get going. Um, I always like to start with some housekeeping. The number one rule of webinars is that there is a live chat here. Please be respectful in the live, live chat. Remember, there's a human being on the other side of the conversation. I am a human being. Please be kind to me. This webinar took a very long time to put together. Uh, I put a lot of work in here, so please be respectful of my time and respectful of those people in the chat. This is a live webinar. It's very content heavy, but at the end, I'm going to do a demo. I am at the behest of the demo gods. I practiced this a hundred times. It worked every single time when I did the practice. If it goes wrong, I'll laugh about it and we'll move on with our lives. But I am at the behest of the demo gods, so please be patient. I like to troubleshoot things if they go wrong live on the call. So I'm not gonna hand wave away and try and see, uh, try and pretend everything's okay. I'll tell you what's happening, what I think is happening, um, if there's a problem. Uh, like I said, I practiced it a lot. We'll see how that goes. The final, uh, the, one of the final things I want to cover in the housekeeping section is that this webinar covers an extremely complicated topic. I have done everything that I can to fit the content of this into a one hour slot. There's a lot of words. I agonized over the way I was going to present this information to you. Got to remember, we've got people live in the webinar. We've got people who are going to watch this on YouTube. We've got people who are going to be able to watch this without listening. So I've really tried to put this together in a way that is accessible to every single type of person who wants to learn. That said, there's a lot of words and a lot more slides than I wanted there to be. So I do apologize for that. But hopefully I'll try and keep it entertaining by cracking a few silly jokes every now and again or terrible jokes. I do ask if you have questions while, while we've got these complicated topics, please try and keep them in the Q&A section. There is a Q&A section in Zoom. I will try and get to them if I have time. If you just post them in the chat, it's gonna get scrolled past. I'm never gonna see it. I have my wonderful colleague, Tim, who's manning the chat. He will try and can remind you to put it in the Q&A section. But if you don't put it in there, I'm very unlikely to get to it. Um, so please try and remember to use the Q&A section. And then finally, I am a fallible human. I have learned about this topic in my time at Tailscale and as a Tailscale user. There are people at Tailscale who are way smarter than I could ever hope to be, who I have had the opportunity to learn from in putting this webinar together. That said, this is my understanding of it. So if I get something wrong, tell me, but please do it politely. Um, I am putting this together to try and solve what I think is the most commonly asked question for us in the solutions engineering team. So I put my understanding of it together, Please remember that. The agenda for today. So we're going to talk about what NAT is and why do we need to know about it when it comes to Tailscale. Then we're going to learn about the different types of NAT through the lens of Tailscale's connectivity. We're going to learn how you at home can identify them. And then we're going to define the results of these different NAT types. And then finally, after, after nerd sniping some of our engineers and also worrying some of our engineers by telling you all about this new special trick, I'm going to tell you about a new special trick at the end. I will be, I will be having a huge asterisk against that particular special trick, but stay until the end. If you're having trouble with connectivity, I'm going to bore you with a bunch of information. If you stay till the end, I'm going to help you be in a situation where you might be able to get kind of direct connections where you didn't be where you weren't previously able to get direct connections. So if there was ever an incentive to stay for an hour and listen to me drone on, I think that might be it. Quick introduction for those who haven't met me before on the Tailscale webinar. I am a solutions engineer here at Tailscale. I was previously a solutions engineer at another company, and then I spent most of my career in DevOps engineering, systems administration, platform engineering. The name changes every, every two years. I had all of those titles. Mainly my responsibility was building infrastructure for a large company, whether it be in the cloud or the data center. That said, I have unfortunately dealt with all of the topics that we've dealt, we're going to talk about here far more than I would have wanted to. Um, there is some code that's associated with this that I have on my GitHub account. I chose my GitHub na name when I was 13. Please don't laugh at me for it. Um, and then I have a website, which I occasionally write on, libriggs.co.uk. I previously written about Tailscale. I write my blog posts on my personal blog because some of the way that I communicate with written language is not necessarily Tailscale corporate friendly. So if you want to uh, read about some of these topics, uh, please also please visit my blog. That's my shameless pitch about myself. Let's get into the topic. So what is NAT? Network Address Translation. 
What is it? Why do we care about it? Well, the first thing that I realized when I started learning about this topic many moons ago is that the whole reason that exists is because people did not realize when they architected the internet that there was going to be as popular as it was. They came up with an addressing system, IPv4, and they thought that many addresses is good, plenty of addresses. We're never going to run out of the addresses like with this huge number. And we've realized pretty quickly that with your so mobile phone, your laptop, everyone's house, all of those different things being connected to the internet, um, we've run out of IPv, IPv4 addresses multiple times. And as a result, that has presented a problem for anybody who wants to build complicated large networks. So the high level idea of what that looks like in reality is at the top here, you see this diagram where if every single device is on the public internet directly and gets a public internet address, um, that we're going to run out really, really quickly of addresses that we can actually hand out to those devices, which means we end up with an internet where there's a queuing system. And as a British person, I would love a queuing system for the internet because it would also mean that we wouldn't have so much nonsense written on the internet. However, that really isn't a reasonable way of doing things. Um, so what, what people did and what the architects of NAT did is they realized that you can actually create a private network behind a public router that has a public address. And as a result, you can then use network address translation to um, basically pretend that that device behind this, this router here is on the public internet. And as a result, that meant that we had an explosion of devices behind these public IPs, behind these routers. Your home, your home router almost certainly is a NAT device. Uh, it, it almost certainly has a public address, which you get from your internet service provider. And then you have probably a 192.168.0.1 style address for all of the things that are connected to your Wi-Fi. To the public internet, when those things reach out to go to a website, what the website sees is the router's public IP. That is the basic definition of what NAT is doing for you. It's giving you the capability of having lots and lots of devices behind a public IP being able to access the public internet. So when we talk about VPNs when it comes to NAT, that the VPN itself requires public connectivity so that the client can connect to it. The NAT device that's in front of all these addresses um, that are in your private network is actually a bit of a problem for a VPN unless you put the VPN directly on the public internet because the public IP doesn't exact, doesn't, might not correspond to where the VPN actually lives. Um, it might be on a device that's behind the NAT device. Uh, sometimes you put the um, the VPN on your router, um, but a lot of times you actually want that VPN to be behind the NAT device and it, it needs to present itself as the actual public IP that the router has. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, the solution here is that you use a port forward or something along those lines where the client connects to the router on a specific port. The router opens that port, let's say, um, 543, 5432, which is the Postgres port, and it's just off the top of my head. Um, the client connects to the router. Um, the router forwards that port, any, any requests to that port through to the VPN server, and you get your direct connection. And that means you can run a VPN behind a NAT device. That's great. Excellent. We've done that for a long, long time. I have run multiple VPNs behind routers like that, and it generally will sort of work, but it will probably suck. It will be a poor experience. People will not like it. It's generally the reason why people come to us at Tailscale. However, and this is a lovely wordy slide for, for everyone, uh, Tailscale doesn't work in the same way as other VPNs because Tailscale lets you run lots and lots of endpoints behind that NAT. You might run a subnet router as a single device, which lots of people do as a successful strategy. But if you want to get the full power of Tailscale, you probably want to run lots of Tailscale devices behind that NAT device. And in that case, a simple port forward is not going to be enough and it's not going to be manageable because it means, let's say you have a NAT device and 100 Tailscale clients behind it, you now have to do 100 port forwards. And that's a big overhead and it's painful and infuriating to those people who are using it. So Tailscale does something that no other VPN that I'm aware of does for you. It actually manages the NAT traversal and uses a bunch of different protocols like the STUN protocol and things like port mapping protocols like UPnP and NAT PMP and PCP. 
and it actually maps those ports for you. Now, you're probably familiar with UPnP because it's probably in your home router and it's used for things like your games consoles to be able to connect to the internet. And so you can get things like direct connections with all the people that you want to shoot on Call of Duty. Um, Tilskill uses all of these established technologies to be able to create direct connections and connections between two clients behind a NAT device. It handles all of this for you. And I think this is something that I personally, when I adopted Tilskill a long time ago, was like, wow, this is like magic. I don't have to do any setup. I don't have to do any configuration. I just install Tailscale and it's able to connect. This is amazing. It also means that that Tailscale works without I needing a public IP address of its own. So with other VPNs, you need to like put in the actual IP address that you want to use to connect in the client configuration. You don't need to do that with Tailscale because Tailscale advertises those addresses and figures out the connectivity path for you. It uses the ICE protocol to do that. So my high level whip together diagram shows a little bit like this. So you have lots and lots of devices behind your router. You have one that's outside of the router. The, the, the UPnP and the natural, sorry, the natural technology that you have at your disposal manages all of this for you. However, NAT devices are all often also firewalls. And that means that you can create outbound connections pretty easily using all those port mapping protocols, but you cannot create inbound connections very easily. And obviously for Tailscale to be able to communicate with each other, you need outbound and inbound connectivity in order to make that happen. So if you think about how that works on your home router or something in your, in your house, you put Tailscale behind your home router, it can use one of the port mapping, pro port mapping protocols like UPnP to create an outbound connection. How does the Tailscale device on the other side, on the internet, actually communicate back to the Tailscale client behind the NAT device, especially when you consider it's a firewall? Well, it's, it's magic. I'm going to start by saying that. It's incredibly sophisticated. But what it does is it sends an outbound packet, and then it when the NAT device says, okay, you send an outbound packet, I'll also allow return traffic back through it, Tilskill leverages that to be able to do this direct communication. So there is a, um, a very um, difficultly drawn diagram in Mermaid here, which sort of explains this. Um, you have a NAT uh, device here between a NAT, NAT device and a, 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 um, a, a Tilskill device here behind another NAT device. The NAT um, the first client, PAA, sends a request to our stun server and says, I have these addresses, and the device behind this NAT also does the same thing. So now the two tail scale devices know about each other. They know what the IP address and port they're allowed to use is. As a result, because they've sent those outbound packets, they can also receive inbound packets through that same address. So they send UDP packets on both sides and says, hey, okay, have you re received the packet? And as a result, you get direct communication. I have massively hand-waved over a very, very complicated topic here. There is an entire magnum opus written by my absolutely wonderful colleague and somebody who's much smarter than me, David Anderson, who talks about this in great depth. It's an incredible piece of work. I personally believe it is the finest technical blog that has ever been written, which I think is a big statement, uh, but it's my favorite technical blog, and I learned so much about this. However, I'm glossing over a very, very long article because I wanted you to have the foundations of how this works so that you can understand all the stuff that I'm going to talk about next. If we want to have an entire um, webinar about how Natraversal works specifically, I could do a full hour on it. Um, but I had to condense this into about 15, 20 minutes so that we have the foundations of how it works. If you want to see a full webinar on how Natraversal works completely without all the other stuff that I'm going to do, please let us know in the comments. We would love to hear about if people are interested in the overall architecture of how Natraversal works. So now that we know why we have Nat and what what we need it for, we could talk a little bit about the different types of NAT that you have. Uh, just taking a quick uh, refreshment break there. Um, so the other thing that I really started to realize as I started to investigate into this as a Tailscale, before I was a Tailscale employee, is that the terminology that was traditionally used around NAT was really confusing, right? We have this kind of full cone and then restricted cone and port restricted cone. And as I'm learning about NAT terminology, I'm like, is this one of those things they put on dogs to stop them chewing themselves? I don't know. That's the only really the only real time that I use the terminology to to uh, cone. Um, so. In RFC 4787, 
um, some new terminology came along, which certainly made a lot more sense to me. They define the two NAT types as endpoint dependent and endpoint independent mapping. And these two terms started to actually really form the sense of what is actually happening for me. And in the Tailscale SE team, and, and sometimes in the wider Tailscale team, we've kind of used two terminologies um, to be able to separate this endpoint depending and endpoint independent mapping. We have the term easy NAT, and then we have the term hard NAT. And this is a way, this is like a broad umbrella to encapsulate very, very complicated topics. If you think of them as buckets, you can put different NATs in these different types of buckets. It's not a, a, a catch-all term that is always correct, but generally you can separate the two NAT types into easy and hard. So, of course, if you have a NAT that is easy and a, a NAT that is hard, there's also a situation where you have absolutely no NAT. And that is, if you have kind of, if I've made any sense so far, you may realize that no NAT is exactly what it sounds like. There is no network address translation device in front of the actual clients that are behind it. Your um, tail scale device has an actual public IP directly attached to it. Um, when we talk about no NAT on the tail scale side, we add a caveat here that in order for us to consider a device that is no NAT, we also need to be able to get direct UDP access to the tail scale devices port. Um, and the reason for that will become clear when we talk about easy NAT, but the first term that you really need to take away from the monologue that I've given so far is that no NAT means that there is a device that has a public IP address directly, and it also has inbound UDP access. So you don't need any NAT uh, at this point. You don't need to do any um, public IP mapping or anything along those lines. You have direct UDP access to the public address. Then we talk a little bit about easy NAT, and this broadly color correlates to endpoint independent mapping in the RFC that we talked about earlier. Um, so an easy NAT is generally something that you would see in your home or your um, smaller networks or your less kind of uh, enterprising networks is generally where I see most of them. Um, so if you're running tail scale in your organization, I'm almost sure that people are running tail scale in their home internet. Most home internet generally tends to be somewhere in the easy NAT bucket. Uh, and the reason for that is that they have home routers that have one of these port mapping protocols enabled on it, um, either UPnP, PCP, or NAT PMP. And as a result, the tail scale device is able to talk to the NAT device and say, hey, I want to open an outbound port, please. Can you give me an outbound port? And the, um, the NAT device says, sure, here's an outbound port for you, and off you go. Um, and then, of course, Tailscale can use that outbound port to be able to have inbound traffic, as we already talked about, these protocols help that process. Again, we talked about this a little bit earlier. You'll generally see this used for things like games consoles when you want to create direct connections. Tailscale uses those same protocols. The thing that's really important to know about NAT is that the, um, the port opening behind the NAT device is predictable and reusable. And that means that when Tailscale initiates its outbound connection, it can use the same port on the reverse side when it comes back in. Um, and that's really important for creating these direct connections that everybody really, really wants to have. So this is a little bit of an idea. And again, it's a really complicated topic. So I've tried to condense this into something that makes sense. Um, so you'll have a client here that's behind a NAT router. The NAT router's IP address is here. What happens is the client connects to our stun server and says, here's where I'm actually coming from. Here's where I'm originating from. Um, and then the NAT device here says, okay, well, you're going for an outbound connection from one, two, three, four, five. I'm good to map that, map that in my NAT table to port five, four, three, two, one. And it sends it off to Tailscale and the stun server says, ah, you initiated a connection from this address and five, four, three, two, one. I know about that now. Thanks for letting me know. It then sends another um, connection to another stun server. Um, and so it doesn't create one connection, it creates multiple outbound connections. And so again, it says, hey, I want to connect to this thing on port 12345. And the NAT device says, ah, you already made that connection, so I'm going to reuse it. And it says, okay, cool. Off to the stun server. And the stun server says, ah, I've seen the second connection come in. And I saw that it's originating from the same IP address and port. Therefore, I can definitely reuse that IP address and port for inbound connectivity. And as a result, 
we now know on the tail scale side what type of NAT it is because you've set those multiple connections and they've both come to this from the same IP and port tuple. We know now that, okay, this is an easy NAT and I can reuse that port to create that connection. Heart NAT, the bane of my existence, the thing that keeps me up at night and the thing that I talk to customers about all the time. Hard NAT broadly correlates to endpoint dependent mapping. And that means that there is no mechanism that Tailscale can use to be able to open an outbound port. It can send an outbound request, but it isn't able to keep an outbound port open like you can see here. And as a result, that means that when the outbound connection is created, it's got some element of port randomization happening. Now, originally this was introduced because they wanted to have the people who, who designed this sort of way of natting were like, okay, well, if we randomize the outbound connections, that'll give us two benefits. It means we can have lots and lots more clients behind the NAT device, and it's also more secure. It's not really more secure. Um, it, it's not really a security feature at this point. Um, that was the original kind of like idea behind it. But I think we've seen lots of different attacks against this mechanism, which means it's not necessarily the case. It does really help with larger networks and it does really help with certain situations, um, especially in larger networks. We generally see this in situations like airports. We see this pretty often in things like corporate offices. We see this pretty regularly in things like um, like WeWorks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we also see this in the cloud providers, which I'll talk about at length when we get to that section. Uh, but it's almost certainly a larger, more complicated network. And as a result, um, the port randomization part is important. And you can see what this looks like in my, again, very shoddily drawn and hastily drawn um, example. So again, we've got a client here. It sends a, a, a request to the stun server um, from port 12345. And the NAT device says, ah, okay, outbound connection. I'm going to map 12345 to 524321. Awesome. And then on the second request, it says, well, I never reuse connections. So this is a brand new connection. So I'm going to map 12345 to port 62000. At which point the stun server says, oh, hold on a minute. That came from a completely different port, but it came from the same IP address. And as a result, I now know that this is a hard NAT. And once you have a hard NAT, you can't reuse that inbound port anymore because you don't know if it's going to always remain open. Um, and and that's, that's a problem for creating these direct connections that Tailscale would love you to have. So how do you identify these different NAT types for you as a user? Um, how are you able to notice within Tailscale whether these are the different types of NAT? Well, the first way of identifying if there is no NAT is um, you see something a little bit like this. So you can see in the Tailscale console, you can also see this output with Tailscale net check, which is a command you can run again against a Tailscale device. Um, the endpoints you can see here, we have one endpoint, which is a private address and then a port and then a public address and a port, right? This is telling me immediately that, okay, well, this particular endpoint like, is, is a public address and there is no port mapping protocol involved here and there's no varies um, here as well. These, these three things will give me a good, good idea that this particular device is no NAT. This is not a fallible thing. There are situations where you'll see this exact setting and it's not actually no NAT. What's really hard for us to be able to detect on the no NAT side is whether the inbound port is open, right? And the reason for that is UDP is stateless. You send a request to this uh, IP address and port via UDP packet, and you know it, 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 we don't necessarily know if it's been received because you, it's a fire and forget protocol. You send that, that set of packets and you're off to the races. You can definitely tell when you do the connection between two different tail scale devices, but you cannot tell directly from here whether this is something that's known at. But this is a pretty good representation of being in a known at situation. How about easy NAT? Well, easy NAT usually is really easy to identify because one of these port mapping protocols is enabled. So you can see on this easy NAT device, I have UPnP enabled. Um, I did notice a quick question in the chat. Um, that UPnP is a potential security risk. What is tail scale behavior when this port mapping protocols are disabled on the ramp? The answer to that is you get hard net. So um, hopefully that answers the question, Kevin. Um, 
we sadly on the tail scale side are not able to come into your houses and fix your UPMP usage. So, um, you know, it's definitely not something that we can do. It would be great if we could, because we could give you all direct connections, but I think that's probably a little bit too, mo too much work for us. Um, so as a result, for easy NAT, you'll definitely see one of these protocols. Uh, uh, despite UNP being a huge security risk, it is generally installed in lots and lots of places that proliferated before we had Tailscale helping you make the uh, connections really easy. So if it's there, we will use it. Um, in, in terms of the security consideration there, it's always worth remembering that WireGuard, that's the underlying encryption protocol, could protect you from these security risks in terms of like transfer, data transfer. Um, so you know, but we will use UPnP if it is available for us for an easy NAT connection. And then the final one, which I think is what most people really care about in this conversation, is hard NAT. How do you identify whether a device has got a hard NAT? Well, the answer here is the most important indicator here is this varies is yes. And what that is saying is that every single time we send a request to a stun server, you can see this here, right? Like this, this device has sent these addresses, like sent requests to our stun servers from this internet address, this 52.41.2.130 address. And every single time that stun server has received a response, it's actually got a different port tuple. So the first one, it was using 41641 because that was the first request. And then it sent a subsequent request and it got it from 42406. Well, now we know we're in a hard NAT. And when this happens, we set varies equals yes. So these are how you're able to identify pretty quickly when what type of NAT your particular device is. Of course, as with everything in life, there are caveats. Um, we uh, talked a little bit about easy NAT being able to use uh, port mapping protocols, and we're talking really in broad strokes here about outbound connectivity. Um, what is particularly important is that if you have something like an AWS security group or a firewall in front of your device uh, on the NAT side, like on the NAT device side, where it can send an outbound packet, but it can't send an inbound packet easily, um, it, it kind of behaves like easy NAT. Um, and, and as a result, um, you are in a situation where you have an easy NAT situation. Um, it's also worth remembering that like this public IP that you see here, and I'll go all the way back to my no NAT. So this public IP address here, it might be the case that if you log into this Tailscale client and look for the IP address, you don't actually see it there because it's not necessarily attached directly to the device in the sense of it's got an interface on the device with this address on it. This is particularly the case in cloud providers, for example, AWS, uh, AWS, where you can attach an elastic IP to a device. It still has a public address, though, and it's still addressable on there. So you might not be able to look at the endpoints table that you see the outbound address and see it directly in the operating system, but it still has a public IP attached directly to it. And then the final thing is we talked a little bit about the ICE protocol earlier. Uh, networks change a lot. Um, and what I mean by that is you disconnect from the Wi-Fi, you reconnect to the Wi-Fi, you move to a different part of the building, and you get roamed to a new ac access point. Tailscale, when you do that, will renegotiate um, the connection to other peers and the stun servers. So while you might have um, a, an easy NAT connection in one part of your building, you might have a hard NAT connection in another part of your building, depending on how you're moving around and how your network is set up. One thing that was uh, was has come up for me multiple times when talking to customers is we look through the logs of the Telscale device and it's like, oh, hold on a minute, you you switch from easy NAT to hard NAT at this time. What did you do? And they say, well, I closed my laptop and I went outside, and as a result, um, we got roamed to we got um, roamed to a new access point. We had a different egress IP, and all of a sudden, I'm now in a hard NAT situation um, again. There's only so much we at Tailscale can do about that if the network is changing, but we will renegotiate to make sure that your connectivity remains. What happens when you have all these different types of connectivity? Well, we've talked a little bit about all the different NAT types. What I think everybody's probably waiting for is like, okay, well, just show me what I need to do to be able to get direct connections, please, Lee, and stop going on about all this different complicated stuff. Well, this is the connectivity matrix. This is now on, uh, on our website. Um, it's on the troubleshooting device connectivity page. I should have included it in the slides. Tim, if you're listening, if you could go and look at the troubleshooting device connectivity page and post it in the slack in the, um, the Zoom chat, that would be super, super awesome. But this is the result 
of all of these different types of NAT. You can see that if you have two devices that have easy NAT, you'll get direct connections. If one side of the equation has a hard NAT, you will get relay connections using our DERP servers. That is the thing that is most commonly fixable when you are getting relay connections. And you can see at the bottom here, the way to fix that, if one side of the equation has a hard NAT, the solution to that is to get the other side of the equation into a no NAT situation. Now, what's really interesting about this is that most organizations and most people have full control over one side of the connection, but not the other side of the connection. What do I mean by that? Well, you've probably installed Tailscale on one side on your home lab, or you've installed Tailscale in your AWS account, or you've installed Tailscale on your data center server. You can modify that side of the connection. What you can't do is all those um, laptops that are moving around, you cannot modify the internet connection of every airport that you go into and every house that you go into, you have no control over that side of the equation. So on the solutions engineering side, what we recommend where possible, if direct connections are important to you is the side of the, the connection that you can control, you should try and get that into no NAT because that means every connection, whether it's an easy NAT or whether it's a hard NAT, will get direct connections. That is the general solution that we have right now for these relay connections. If bandwidth is important, if latency is important, if throughput is important, look at the way you've architected Tailscale and put the side of the um, connection that you have the most control over into a no NAT situation. That usually means getting into a public subnet if you're in a cloud provider, if you're using your home lab, get a device that's your like NAT device, like um, your Wi-Fi router, that gets the, or sorry, your modem that gets the direct IP address, put that into a no NAT situation, you'll always get direct connections. So what can you do differently? I already covered this. Um, I already covered some of this. But um, the if you could all just kind of stop what you're doing and move to IPv6, that would be awesome because all of these problems go away with IPv6. There is a, a concept of NAT traversal in IPv6, but because there's so many more available addresses, you don't need them anymore. You don't need to NAT these devices. Of course, me asking a customer, well, if you want direct connections, it's time to turn on IPv6 and they go, maybe I'll just use a different product. It's probably not uh, the outcome that I want as a solution engineer. So, you know, IPv6 adoption is a really, really important part of the future of the internet. And, you know, we've been talking about it for 10 years. I think there's a famous Bill Gates quote, Bill Gates quote that says, um, everything in technology that's going to take three years will take 10 years. And everything that in technology that says that we think will take 10 years will take three years. Um, so we're definitely in the kind of, we, we thought we'd be IP, IPv6 everywhere in three years and we're 10 years down the line and we're not even close to that. I will say my ISP has an IPv6 address, so I'm fine. Um, but, you know, really getting into a place, especially in AWS, right? If you're spinning up a new AWS VPC and some point in the future and you think, I don't really need IPv6, please reconsider that. I think it would be really awesome if we just started to think as Tailscale customers. You know, Avery, um, our CEO, put a great uh, blog post out uh, a few weeks back around the new internet. I think part of the new internet is going to have to be IPv6 everywhere. Um, this will solve all these problems, by the way. I have yet, I've yet to see um, an organization that's using IPv6 not getting direct connections. Generally, they get direct connections. Um, but of course, the, we're a long way from IPv6 adoption, true IPv6 adoption. And I already covered this, but moving your Tesco device into a public no -nat, public subnet or a no NAT situation um, is the easiest way to fix this problem. Always make sure that you're opening UDP port 41641 to that particular uh, tail scale device, that will get you direct connections. However, the moment you've all been waiting for, I'm absolutely amazed I'm getting through this in this time, by the way. I thought this was going to take way longer, which means I'm going to have time for questions at the end, which is great. Um, there is a new experiment, experimental approach, and I can feel our engineering team wincing as, as I talk about this. I am going to make this unequivocal. This is highly experimental. This will change. This is not something that you should rely on in production yet. And we are not finished building this capability out. I had to beg our engineering team to talk to you folks about this. And that's not an exaggeration. I had to beg them. 
can we please give people an answer to this problem that is not IPv6, please? And they're like, yeah, well, we've got an answer. Uh, and I'll be honest, I nerd sniped one of our engineers into implementing this um, and he shipped it. And now I'm talking about it, right? We're not documenting this on our website because one of the reasons for that is when we document something on our website, we say it's not going to break. The backwards compatibility of Tailscale is something that is breathtaking to me. Um, so we're not documenting this in this website, but I'm going to talk about it in this webinar so that people can try this out and see what it looks like. Um, but we added an environment variable and we also have a configuration file, which I'm not going to talk about just yet. Uh, we have a configuration file and an environment variable where you can actually update the endpoints manually. So you are able to set the endpoints that Tailscale has identified via its natural technology. And this means that you can get direct connections if you put something in front of the Tailscale device that can forward ports to the Tailscale device. Please, please do not mistake how experimental this is and how it will change in the future. Please be aware of that. Um, I, I hope I've made that uh, clear enough. I'm going to look in the um, in the chat here. Um, yes, it uh, looks like people like experimental things. That's great. Please don't rely on this. It will change. I think this will still be something that we implement in our production level manner in the future. But for the time being, give it a try. See if it helps. Um, what does this look like in reality? Well, here's an example from my cloud provider of choice, AWS, um, where I put an NLB in the actual VPC in a public subnet, and then I do a port forward to the EC2 instance that Tailscale is running on. Cool, I now get a direct connection. So let's have a little bit of demo of all of the stuff that we've seen today. Um, this is the part where I ran these demos 100 times. Whether it goes well or not, let's let's see. Um, but let's get to it. So first of all, I'm going to show you my uh, my personal telnet, my LBR Labs telnet, uh, and you can see I've provisioned a whole bunch of different um, clients here that have been very helpfully named with the type of NAT they have. So let's go and take a look at this no NAT machine here. As we looked at previously, you can see that I've got the endpoints here. Varies is no. Um, there's no port mapping included. I know this is no NAT because I know I also opened the AWS security group for this to make sure that it has inbound UDP access. Let's go and take a look at my easy NAT instance, which is all the way up here. You can see I've got UPMP enabled here. It's initiated an outbound connection to port 41641. The way that it's done that is using UPMP. So what's happened again is that uh, Tailscale has initiated its outbound connection. It said, hey, I'm going to open port 41641. And the, the UPMP device has said, excellent, that's really great for you. I'm going to give you port 41641 because nobody's using it. Um, and as a result, um, we have used the port mapping protocol to be able to actually get that um, outbound connection. Again, it's behind a NAT device, so be aware that it is still easy NAT, right? Um, and you see, we still have a public endpoint here, and we still have a port here. But this public endpoint is not necessarily attached directly to the machine. That's the thing to really remember. And then finally, my evil hard NAT instance, right? And you can see it's got all these different endpoints here, and it's got all these different ports and varies is yes. Um, and so as a result, um, we're in a situation where we know we're in a hard NAT. So what does the result of this look like when I do a bunch of things? And I'll I'll be honest, everyone listening, I was like, how can I actually make this interesting without just pinging a bunch of devices? And the answer is, you cannot. Um, so what I'm going to do is Ubuntu at known at east. Excellent. Uh, you'll notice I'm using Tailscale SSH for this um, because that's the best way to do these things. Um, and if I do tail scale ping, I can do hard NAT west, and you'll notice that I get a direct connection, obviously, because as we already noticed, one side of the equation here, this particular machine is in a no NAT situation. So I get a direct connection, I get lovely low latency, and I don't see a relay server in here. If I do the opposite with the hard NAT instance, where I can do tail scale ping, hard NAT, and I've, I've, I've ruined my big surprise here. But let's just keep going and pretend you don't see that. Um, if I do hard NAT West, you'll notice that. Uh, ooh, uh, hard NAT West. Server misbehaving. Interesting. I didn't see that before. Let me ping the IP address instead. 
of course the server's misbehaving on my demo. Why wouldn't it? Um, so you can see here, this is the thing that most people are frustrated with. They're getting uh, relayed via our derp servers. Yes, I am a masochist. Yes, I run my own derp server. Don't know why I do this, but I do. Um, so you can see here that when we do two hard NAT, two different hard NAT uh, connections on both sides of the equation, we get this uh, relayed connection here. Um, and this will add a little bit of latency. It will limit the amount of throughput. We have QoS on our DERP servers so that we don't have uh, individuals or organizations that abuse the amount of throughput we have on our DERP servers. We're constantly growing the fleet, um, but in some situations, this will kind of have a performance impact on the ability for you to do low latency things, for example. You can see when we look at the NONAT, like this is in 62 milliseconds. I'm using AWS here on both sides of the equation. So I'm only getting like an extra, you know, 0.6 milliseconds of latency. Um, but the um, the latency is increased very slightly as we go through our derp server. Um, and then this one, so I'm not able to actually practice this one because, and you'll see why in a minute. So what I'm going to do is do tail scale ping easy nat west. And you'll notice, so you'll see here that I'm originally getting derped, right? So like it starts out with derping me. Um, and it says, okay, both sides of the equation are in easy NAT. It starts out in a derp situation. You can see there's a 86, 87, 86 milliseconds of latency. And then what happens is that Tailscale realizes because both sides are easy NAT and it can reuse those ports, it then establishes a direct connection. So you'll see it started, from, we got three derp requests, and then it got a direct connection. This is what happens when you have both sides of the equation being in easy NAT. Now, I'm going to take a quick refreshment break, and then I'll explain why that's important. Hey, Craig, I see your raised hand. I'm going to come back to it. I want to make sure I finish the content first. Thank you for being a participant in the webinar. Uh, I will come back to you, uh, uh, hopefully. Um, so why is it important that easy nap derps and then uh, gets direct connections? Well, what we generally see in most scenarios where someone goes, well, I was getting direct connections and now I'm getting relayed and it sucks and the behavior is weird and it's a really poor experience. The reason for that is that either the NAT type changed, the easy NAT um, kind of by the ICE protocol continuously renegotiating, the easy NAT changed, or something changed in the network that is outside of the control of tail scale. And as a result, it can no longer get these direct connections anymore. I've seen this happen when the NAT table fills up, right? So like you have multiple clients behind the NAT device and like all of them are opening ports. And then all of a sudden you've got a thousand tail scale clients behind a NAT device and all of a sudden the NAT table is filled up. Then it will start derping, right? Because now the NAT device is saying, well, I can't give you that port back because somebody else is using it. And I've actually run out of ports. So as a result, I'm now going to have to randomize every outbound connection and therefore um, we're going to have to relay you, right? This is the thing that I think most people get frustrated with when they're using Tailscale. They're like, well, cool, I had direct connections. The likelihood is that they had easy NAT on both sides. And now all of a sudden they don't have direct connections and they've gone from you know, 64 milliseconds of latency to you know, 90 milliseconds of latency. It's a noticeable difference if you're doing something that's latency sensitive. And as a result, it can be a pretty poor experience for people. Um, so what's the solution to that? Well, the solution to that is of course to turn things into no NAT. And so what does that look like? So again, I'm on a no-nap device here, and I can do, from a no-nap device, I can do easy nat west. And you should get a direct connection, right? Because one side of the equation is no-nap, and the other side of the connect connection is easy nat. So I'll get direct connections once the kind of negotiations happen. I'll get direct connections pretty quickly every single time. That's awesome, right? Um, I, I think that's really, really important for all of these, uh, you know, all of these different things. Try and get one side of the equation into a no nat situation. However, the experimental thing that we talked about, well, what does that look like? Well, what I've done for this hard nat with load balancer is I put an NLB in front of it. Um, and let's have a look at the Terraform code, shall we? If you're not familiar with Terraform, I apologize. This is how I do things in AWS. So you can, let's have a look what we've got here. We've got a, an a NLB, right, that I've got for my West Coast, um, my US West um, instances. And I've created a target group that allows port 41641 
with UDP, right? Um, you'll notice that the health check here, I'm not actually able to use that port 41641 for the health check because of course you can't actually do any health checks on UDP ports. Um, and then also set a listener on here that is also on port 41640 and UDP, and then I've attached it to the instance, right? So if you imagine what this looks like, and I probably should have had the AWS console up and running, but I don't, so I apologize for that. Um, what this looks like is that I've got a load balancer in front of this hard NAT device. The instance itself is in a private subnet. And when a request comes in from port four, to port 41641 on the load balancer on UDP protocol, it immediately forwards that through to the instance, right? That's great. But the problem is, let's have a look at my hardnet instance here. The problem is, Tailscale doesn't know about this load balancer, right? Because all it knows about is the endpoints that we use to initiate outbound connections. So Tailscale no, doesn't know to use this endpoint. So you've got this load balancer with all these public IP addresses that's listening on port 41641, but it doesn't know to use it. So it's effectively irrelevant at this point, right? Like it's just a, a pointless load balancer that's in front of an instance. So what we can do with a new mechanism with the config file is we can update the endpoints table. And you can see here, these are the IP addresses of the load balancer with port 41641 open. And so now Tailscale knows, hey, there's an actual endpoint that is listening on port 41641. And you can see this is still varies is true is yes, or varies is yet is true. Um, and you can still see that it's the same outbound endpoints. Look here um, with like port randomization involved. But I also have predictable endpoints that the NLB is providing for me. I've let Tailscale know about these endpoints by doing this. Let me switch to sudo. Uh, it looks like my session's timed out. That's super useful, Lee. Let's do SSH Ubuntu at hardnet west with LB. Thank you, Watt, for remembering what I'm doing. So what I've done, all I've done here is add in an override to the Tailscale D daemon down, down here. Um, the engineer, Brad, who is easily one of the smartest engineers I've ever worked with, uh, is also one of the funniest engineers that I worked with, uh, was like, we'll call it a pretend point because it's not a real endpoint. And I'm like, that's awesome. Uh, you'll notice the debug flag here. That debug flag means will change, could go away, might not be the same. The fact that you're using a debug flag means your mileage may vary. Don't blame us if we turn it off. I made it super clear. We haven't documented it on the website. So if it goes away, don't get upset with us. I've been as clear as I possibly can. But these are all the actual load balancer IP addresses and ports, right? So as a result, we now have these endpoints that are advertised on the actual endpoints table. So what does that look like? As a reminder, if I do tailscale ping for my hardnet instance, I get relayed. If I do tailscale ping hardnet west with LB, I get a direct connection. So I now have two instances in private networks behind an AWS managed NAT gateway that I can now get direct connections behind. And I'm using a load balancer to do that. What are some of the things you need to think about here? Well, AWS likes to bill you for data transfer. So anything that's going to go through this load balancer, any data that's going to go through this load balancer is going to cost you money. So don't blame me if your AWS bill goes up because you're doing this and you want to direct connections and you're dumping your entire 40 terabyte database through Tailscale. That is something that you have to think about in your AWS architecture, but through an um, you know, through a load balancer, that's a lot of data. If data transfer is a concern for you and the amount of data that you want to actually tra tra transfer is a consideration, put a tail scale subnet router in a public subnet and do it that way. Put it into known that. This is really usable for those situations where you don't, you have a security requirement that says no EC2 instances in public subnets. Um, that comes up often with our customers. Um, so this is a solution for you. Um, so let's finish up. Uh, I'm going to take a little second here to scroll through the track, through the chat, um, and see if there's any questions. Let's have a look at the time. Oh, I've only got 10 minutes. I'm going to finish the slides, and then I'll try and get through some questions. So what are some domain-specific considerations here? Well, the, the one thing that comes up all the time is, well, I'm running my Telescope clients on Kubernetes, and I can't get direct connections. Why is that? 
Well, the reason for that is because Kubernetes is complicated um, and it adds a layer of NAT to the equation that the CNI implements. When you have a pod running on a host, all those connections that go out to the internet get natted through the host as well. And there are lots of situations that we've seen with the CNI where they implement on IP tables natting, they implement fully random outbound connections, which is essentially a hard nat. So when you run Kubernetes pods with Tailscale in them, most of the time they are hard natted. Um, and the reason for that I've just mentioned is because you get nat, nat from the from the host address. However, um, it is um, it is fixable, but you have to use host networking to get around that CNI thing. We personally are not making any guarantees around direct connections on Kubernetes right now. I talk to customers every single day who are like, I'm running this in Kubernetes and I need direct connections. So what can I do about it? And the answer to that is don't run your Telscale workloads on Kubernetes. If you're using a cloud provider like EKS, take advantage of the fact that the AWS EKS CNI gives you IP addresses from the VPC. So you can put a subnet router on a public subnet, no NAT it, still get the same capability that you would get with uh, Tailscale subnet routing running in the cluster. However, you can get direct connections and you can still reach your Kubernetes pods. Bear that in mind. I could do an entire hour long thing about this. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time, but the thing to take away from it here is the Kubernetes CNI makes it difficult to get direct connections and hard NAT most connections. So it's outside of our hands. Complain to your cloud provider about it. Like, I wish this was not the case. Again, if you use IPv6, not necessarily a problem, um, but you know there is a, a lot of stuff here that is outside of our hands on the Tailscale side. AWS, uh, AWS managed NAT gateways, which almost everybody that I speak to uses. We moved away from NAT instances. There are ways to run your own NAT instances, which will give you an easy NAT experience, but you know then you're going to manage NAT and, and have to manage the EC2 compute for that. Um, AWS managed NAT gateways, force all connections to be hard NAT. I had a conversation with the AWS NAT gateway team. They're aware of this. It's a really hard problem to solve. Um, so if you're interested in logging the internal feature request that we have with um, we have with um, with AWS to fix this, so it bumps it up their priority list, please email me. And I can't believe I'm going to do this in a public webinar. Please email me directly, lee at tailscale.com, and say, hey, can you add my company to this list of people that are affected by this problem? And I will make sure it's added. Um, or I can give you instructions on how your account manager can do that. AWS has a path to fixing this, but it's not easy, and it's going to be hard to implement in their data plane. So this is something that I would love to have fixed. If AWS managed NAT gateways were easy NAT, things will be a lot easier, but they are hard NAT. Our suggestion, as I've said over and over again, is to put the instances in public subnets. Azure managed NAT gateway, very, very simple. Um, it is worth noting that managed NAT gateways, it's like Azure has realized they can build for outbound data transfer through NAT gateways. So like I want a piece of that. Uh, so NAT gateways are pretty new. The last time I looked a, a few months ago, um, like this was, they were deprecating the ability to do egress from VNets um, without a NAT gateway. So this is going to become more widespread. Um, so again, public subnets are the way to go here. And then Google um, has an actual setting to turn on um, on its public NAT to turn on easy NAT, uh, which it has as endpoint independent mapping. Um, take a look at that link. Um, you can Google, um, you can search for on Google, uh, Google uh, G, G Cloud NAT ports and addresses. There's a setting that you can set that forces things into easy NAT. That will give you direct connections in lots and lots of situations and is a little bit better than the situation in other cloud providers. That was a lot of words and a lot of slides. I appreciate everybody listening to me drone on. Um, I'm going to take a quick minute to have a refreshment break and take a drink. And then I'm gonna try and see if I can get through the 16 open questions. So give me a few moments. Excellent. Okay, big long question from Mark. Uh, been using Telescope for two years, so you can understand I love Telescope or not. I switched to Mac, there's a little problem I face when trying to use Telescope on Mac. Second name, I select Telescope, use a HTT proxy. I have HTT proxy in my connection at school, blah, blah, blah. So it looks like here that this is a problem around, um, around using an outbound proxy. It's funny how these serendipitous these things are. Um, Telescale makes no guarantees about you being able to use a proxy right now. Um, and the reason for that is that when it does the outbound connections, it needs to be able to navigate that outbound connection. Um, 
And we don't have any proxy traversal technology built into the product. So I don't think we can make any guarantees. It seems like you already reached out to support. Um, it, I would love to know if that uh, means that you just don't get any connections at all. My suspicion is you probably get hard added connections when you have those proxies. Um, but yeah, I, I do apologize. Part of the thing that is in play here is that Tailscale uses HTTPS to both connect to the DERP servers and also connect to the control plane. Um, so, you know, I, I do apologize that, that like the, the restrictive environment that you're running in is, um, you know, requiring to you to use a proxy, but there's no real guarantee that Tailscale is actually able to traverse that situation. So I do apologize for that. Um, I noticed you opened a GitHub issue. I'll take a look at it afterwards and see if I can get a response on there for you. Uh, but I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. I think that's answered. Okay. Kevin, can you compare, contrast, stun, turn, dirt? Okay. Uh, the very quick answer, I've got four minutes, but I can run a little bit over. Um, stun is the session traversal for NAT. I can't remember the acronym's exact thing. Um, stun is the thing that we use to identify the um, the endpoints that we have uh, got from. DERP is a technology that Tailscale has, has developed that will, in those cases where we're in hard now, we can't create direct connections, will relay connections for you. I tried not to go deep into what DERP does and how it works for this particular um, webinar. I think that's a potentially great future webinar discussion, but they're actually different things. STUN is the thing that is detecting the endpoints. DERP is the thing that is relaying traffic on your behalf. What's, what's the thing for us is that we run them on the same server. Um, so we have a stun server that is running on our derp servers, and we use them for both both things for obvious reasons. Uh, so there's not a compare and contrast; they're actually used for different things. Um, okay, is there a situation where a firewall can still be easy now, even when UPnP etc. are disabled, but top ports aren't varied or between outbound requests? Yes, there is a situation where a firewall can be easy now, even when UPnP etc. are disabled. If it's a state, if it, if it's a certain type of firewall, and I'm blanking on whether because I've just talked for an hour straight. I can't remember if it's a stateful or stateless firewall, that will look like an easy NAT too, because it will allow you to create an outbound connection and it will hold that connection open for inbound requests. That kind of looks like an easy NAT. Um, if you turn off the, if you allow inbound request, requests to the firewall with UDP port that Tailscale is running on, you'll get a no NAT. So yes, there is definitely situations where things can look um, like an easy NAT. Again, AWS security groups are a great example of that. If you, uh, if you have a public IP address on an AWS instance, and this is something that comes up really often, people will say, well, I moved Tailscale into a public subnet in a cloud provider, and uh, I'm still getting relay connections. And I say, have you opened an inbound port for UDP? And they say, well, my security team won't let me do that. And I'm like, well, the best that you're going to be able to do is easy NAT, uh, easy NAT uh, in terms of its behavior. It's not technically easy NAT because it has a public address. But as you remember, I have a big bucket that I'm putting things into. So I'm going to put it in the easy NAT bucket. Um, when the result is relayed, how's that fact the latency bandwidth and also the cost? Um, there is no additional cost to using relayed servers, Gavin. So you do not need to worry about additional cost on the tail scale side. However, there are QoS implementations on per tail net on the DERP servers. That mean that you um, your initial connections will be very, very latency, um, latency uh, will have good latency and bandwidth. I think there's a limit in terms of the bandwidth that we can actually push through DERP servers. However, the more you like the more connections you use over DERP, the more QoS there is in place there. So you may see that there is lots and lots of different uh, connections and then like performance is impacted. We generally see this when there's thousands of connections. If you have 10 clients, you're likely not going to run into this. Uh, can we enable IPv6 in Tailscale? Uh, on my Tailscale clients, they say support IPv6, but it's not enabled. Um, that is probably on your operating system. So that likely means that you either haven't enabled IPv6 in your operating system, um, um, but the actual kernel that you're running or the device that you're running on has support for IPv6. You just need to turn it off. Um, it's an operating system thing. It's not a tail scale thing. By default, all tail scale devices get an IPv6 address. Let's quickly show you what that looks like. Um, so you can see here, the tail scale IPv6 address is here. Um, and you can see IPv6, no. That means the actual device, um, like the actual operating system underneath here, does not IPv6 enable. 
But I, if I turn it on, I'll get IPv6, yes. Hopefully that answers that question. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. What are the firewall is extra consideration in the and the and IPv6? Could do a whole thing on this. I'm going to try and do a very, very quick explanation. Um, IPv6, because it, um, it, it allows every single device, even in like um, what we call private subnets, because the way it kind of calculates an IPv6 from a prefix, um, it basically means that every single device has IPv6 address directly associated with it. There are firewall considerations around like easy NAT. Um, so like if you don't allow inbound UDP connections, for example, both devices will look like an easy NAT instance, um, but, but, but you don't have that kind of network change kind of configuration that comes into play with IPv6 that you do with IPv4. Um, so there are considerations around like, I, you don't necessarily need to open inbound UDP access with IPv6. So I would recommend, um, you know, looking at it from that perspective. Long story short, if you could turn on IPv6, I would go ahead and do it. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I already answered this. I already answered this one. Uh, I don't know. Really sorry, Larry. I'm not really sure what you're getting at when you say, what about CG now? Just a high level thing. Uh, Tailscale um, gives IP addresses out from the CG NAT carrier grade NAT space. I'm going to make a leap here and say, well, what if you have CG NAT uh, behind the scenes. Um, that is not my area of expertise, but my understanding is you can get it to work. So um, if you have questions around this, around CGNAT and the usage of CGNAT, we have an office hours with SEs that I run with my wonderful colleague, Alex. Um, please join us to ask that sort of question around CGNAT. Um, if a server is running several Docker containers with Tailscale sidecars in a home lab, what kind of configuration would I need to implement IPv6 for Docker sidecars? Assuming my ISP provides IPv6 a cost. Okay, so you have your uh, NAT device, which has an IPv6 ad uh, address. Um, what you then need to do is enable IPv6 in your home network. So usually on your NAT um, instance, you'll have like, uh, sorry, on your like, home router, you'll have the ability, depending on the router model, of course, like most home routers don't actually let you do this. Um, you will need to also give the Docker containers their own IPv6 address from the prefix that the NAT device is handed out. Um, it's an advanced thing at the moment, and it's generally because most uh, ISPs don't send you a router that has IPv6 available. If you have your own router, like I have a Unify router um, that I can enable IPv6, so all the addresses in my house get IPv6 addresses. So that's the way to solve that problem. It will depend on the different types of networking, uh, sorry, the different types of equipment that you have at home, but the answer is that you need to enable IPv6 on the actual network that you're on. And what that means is your laptop or your server that is running the Docker containers needs an IPv6 address. And then you could hand an IPv6 address to the Docker containers as well. I actually don't know if Docker supports IPv6 very well right now. Um, so I don't know if that's actually even possible. Something for me to look up. But again, Kevin, please feel free to come to our SE office hours that are once a month. And we'd love to talk about that in more detail. Um, I think that's a really great question. Uh, answer live. Are you able to explore a solution to get direct connections on EKS with private or public networks using AWS CNI? I think I've really covered this, uh, Gabriel. It's out of our hands. Um, if you use the EKS CNI and you have private subnets, um, um, you are not going to get direct connections. We really can't offer that right now. That is because the EKS CNI implements fully random outbound connections. That is a decision that was made in uh, on uh, EKS, and I'm afraid there's really not much we can do about that right now. Um, what are the benefits of running your own DERP server? We are also considering. Please don't do this. It's really not fun. Um, the benefits are that you get slightly increased throughput. It's not much more than the public DERP servers. Uh, you can also collocate them locally with your um, with your infrastructure, so you get a very very small increase in latency. Um, I would not recommend running your own DERP server at this point. Um, it's it's really not something that we we recommend. Um, you may, the, the people that really run their own derp servers are doing it because they have very restricted egress environments that they can't whitelist all of um tailscale's public ip addresses um i would excuse me i would really not recommend doing this at this point um so um yeah i'm just a masochist i wanted to know how it works i get very little value out of my derp server just to be super clear like it's it's basically the same as our seattle derp server i'm actually a little bit slower in most situations but because i talk to customers that are running derp servers um i wanted to know how they worked basically so i would really not recommend doing that uh i don't know what that question is 
How can you afford, how can you afford free accounts when all relay traffic goes through your service? Because we love Tailscale and because people pay for Tailscale. I'm a solutions engineer. If you love Tailscale at home and you want to use it at work and you want to be able to keep getting relay traffic, please talk to us about using Tailscale at work and buy an enterprise contract. And then we can give all of your home lab users um, all this excellent relay traffic without having to, um, you know, tr charge money. We're not going to charge money for relayed servers. It's part of the uh, the contract that we have with our users. But the fact that we're a stable, well-run, excellent business with an excellent product means that we can offer this for free. So that's a really great question, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, why is download speeds very slow when even want to have direct connections when using an exit node? That's a very, very broad question, Gerald. Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that without kind of debugging more. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about what you're downloading. That's a really great question for our office hours. I feel like that would be better suited to a format where I have a full hour to answer questions. Unfortunately, I can't really answer that without a little bit more information. Where are the relay servers located? You can have a look. Uh, tail scale, derp servers. There is a, a, a derp servers list here. These are where we're all running derp servers right now. Um, so you can see that really easily on the website. How do I find the SE office hours? office hours? Tim, can you help Kevin find the SE office hours, please? We have a lot of restrictive um, egress environments. The only, we, they only want to allow one IP address with specific bars. How would you best handle this, your own DERP server? Can you please email se at tailscale.com with that question? I think we probably need to have a bit of a longer conversation about what the restrictive egress environments look like. I'm actually talking to another customer right now that's experiencing this problem. It's not an easy problem to solve. Tailscale makes a lot of assumptions about how it's able to do outbound connectivity. And I'm starting to think we probably need to bring our product team into these conversations. Um, are the downsides of using public subnet routers versus put ECT of uh, using subnet versus put ECT on public subnets? Um, the answer to this question around like are the downsides of using subnet routers versus putting EC2 instances on public subnets? Um, there isn't really a downside other than uh, it's a it's a security consideration for many organizations. They want to have that public uh, surface area. Also, uh, EC2 instances, uh, sorry, EC2 uh, AWS now charges for public. Uh, subnets, so public IP addresses. I think they're $4 a month each or something like that. So it's a cost consideration. If you want to put all of your um, EC2 instances in public subnets, you're likely going to have a very easy time when it comes to direct connections. But there are trade-offs you need to think about around different, um, you know, different considerations there. Uh, I'm going to answer one more question. Um, I... Uh, what do you think of the trade-offs using public routers and public VPCs to get direct connections between entities and private VPCs versus hosting the entities on public VPCs with the um, with the Tailscale UDP port outside of firewall? Um, I'm, maybe I'm just kind of my brain has just gone to sleep now, Nantes. So I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I don't know how to answer this question. I think I've just kind of like exhausted my brain capacity right now, and I'm not really understanding it very well. If you wouldn't mind saying, bringing this to our um, bringing this to our SE office hours, office hours, I would love to try and answer it. Um, okay. Um, I think this has been pretty comprehensive. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the chat, so I haven't had a chance to look through it yet. Um, I really appreciate everybody who has attended. It's been a wonderful experience being able to talk to you about my experience here. Uh, I'm going to stop looking at my second screen here and look at the camera. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience being able to wrap it on for an hour and 15 minutes. Hopefully I answered your questions. Hopefully I didn't create more questions. Uh, I love feedback. Um, so, you know, if you enjoyed this webinar, please, I'm going to leave the chat open for another five minutes just to give everybody an opportunity to, um, to comment. But if you enjoyed this webinar, please let us know in the comments. Um, I run webinars once a month. Uh, we do the SE, we do the SE office hours. Hopefully, Tim posted a link in here um, that will allow you to join us to ask questions. That's my favorite um, webinar that we do, by the way. Alex and I just get to hang out, chat with each other, answer questions. We bring a guest. We had Avery, our CEO, on the last one, which was awesome. I learned a lot from that conversation. Uh, it looks like we've got lots and lots of questions. So please keep them coming to our SE off and our office hours. Um, but really appreciate everybody's time. I will uh, leave the chat open for a couple of minutes so everybody can, can uh, post their comments. But thank you very much. I'm going to go off video now. I'm going to take a big sigh of relief. And hopefully you all enjoyed the experience. Thank you so much.